Margaret Mead famously mused, anthropologist Margaret Mead famously mused, that in her view, the first evidence of civilization wasn't an artifact of a tool, wasn't a building, but rather a 15,000-year-old fossil of a healed fracture, giving evidence that someone else had helped this person, this injured person, to safety and eventual recovery. My name is Nina Tandon, and I'm a tissue engineer, and I'm very proud for the fact that for the past 18 years, <laughs> I've been working on building on this cornerstone of human civilization, restoring the damaged body. Humans are ingenious. Throughout history, we have devised many ways to help our bodies repair themselves when they can't do them on their own. We've invented surgical techniques and all kinds of dazzling medical technologies. And astonishingly, 75% of us will eventually acquire parts of our bodies that we weren't born with. This wouldn't be a problem, except um, the only way to, well, the only way to get human bone is to cut it out of a human, yourself or somebody else, and synthetic implants fail, especially the earlier we get them. And so bone being the most transplanted human material and joint replacements being one of the biggest examples of synthetic implants, as we think about the po population that's getting injured earlier and earlier in life and living longer and longer, and these trends are continuing globally, we need our implants to last as long as we do. And what we do in our field of tissue engineering, in the academic setting and now in the company setting, is to come up with living one-and-done solutions that function on day one, but also live as long as we do. Over a decade ago, I had the opportunity to share the promise of this approach. Um, and it's, it's been really kind of a rebellious path for me, I would say, because in many ways we are turning the paradigm of medicine upside down, sotto sopra, as you might say, <laughs> um, because in, for so much of medical history, we have looked outside the body for cures, to pills and devices. But with this approach, we're looking inside. The patient isn't just receiving medicine, but the patient is the medicine. More specifically, the patient's cells are the active ingredient. And cells are so amazing. They're nature's building block of life. And we all started out our lives as one cell big, and the cells grew our bodies in the first place and repair them every day. What we as tissue engineers look to harness the power of the cell to make implants that live just as long as we do. In 2014, um, my colleagues and I from um, my, the lab where I did my PhD, uh, Gordana Vunyak Dovakovic's lab at Columbia University, spun um, a company out um, of the lab um, with several colleagues, including myself. And one of our colleagues, Elisa Cimetta, my dear, brilliant friend, uh, yes, <laughs> um, I call her Brain. <laughs> That's my nickname for her. She's, um, she ended up you know, co-founding this company with us, but eventually moved back to her home institution here in Padova to become a professor of chemical engineering. And so you can imagine how delighted I am to be here in her hometown to share with you how far we've come in the past 10 years, but also how far we have yet to go. So, here's how our technology works. We start from a CT scan, from which we can extract three-dimensional data and make a perfect puzzle piece shaped biomaterial and perfect puzzle piece shaped bioreactor. A bioreactor is really just a fancy word for an advanced cell culture system that mimics the conditions of the human body, providing controlled oxygen, nutrients, and mechanical forces that get the stem cells to attach to the scaffold, proliferate, and most importantly, differentiate. It takes us 
three weeks to grow bone and four weeks to grow cartilage. And we have a platform technology which can serve any of the 207 bones or 360 joints throughout our bodies. I'm proud to say that in 2021, our company made history as the very first biotechnology company to gain permission from the FDA to apply this approach in the clinic. And um, so I'd like to give you a sense of where we are with that. It, it was really historic for us to be making this leap from the idea we had in the lab towards a technology to implant in people. But it was also very emotional for us because it was one step closer to making good on this mission that we have to serve human patients. So our first patient, our very first patient, was a 49-year-old person who'd suffered from a traumatic injury to the head and face due to a car accident. His jaw had been badly broken. And all we did was we took a small sample of his fat tissue, a little vial, and we extracted the stem cells out of it and grew new bones, perfectly shaped bones that could help re restore both sides of his jaw, giving him the ability, get, restoring his facial symmetry and also his ability to bite. Um, I'm happy to say that now almost one year post-implantation, he's doing very well. The bone is precise and exactly where we put it and is continuing to um, integrate to the surrounding tissue. Um, more importantly, the patient is able to speak and eat, and perhaps most importantly, we were able to provide these bones to him without having to cut them out of his hip, of his elbow, or his rib in order to restore his jaw. This was a historic surgery for our field, but as I mentioned, it was especially emotional for us because this was such a life-changing surgery for him, and we take our work very seriously as scientists. Our second patient suffered from a jaw that was degenerating so badly that it obstructed his ability to breathe, and especially while sleeping. We took a small sample of his fat tissue, <laughs> extracted the stem cells out of them, and grew a perfect puzzle piece-shaped bone that allowed us to elongate his jaw, restore facial symmetry, and most importantly, allow him to breathe. You can see the bones growing in their little bioreactors, and you can see the bone perfectly in place after implantation. Our third patient waited until his 18th birthday to enroll in our trial, and during his first semester in college, we took a small sample of his fat tissue, and in between his first and second semesters at college, we um, provided him bones for both sides of his face that allowed him to have facial symmetry for the first time in his life and also relieve airway obstruction. Um, we are so honored to be working with these patients who are volunteering to help move medical science forward. There are many benefits to this type of approach. First, because we use 3D design, the grafts fit perfectly, like perfect puzzle piece shapes. Secondly, because we're using stem cells derived either from you or from donors, the tissue is yours. And thirdly, because it's alive, it can, can participate in the biological processes of being a human, just like any other part of your body that you were born with. I am so proud of how far we've come in the past 10 years. We took an idea that we had in the laboratory, we turned it into inventions that we tested in the laboratory, and then in pre -clinical. I'm finishing up. <laughs> yeah, this is my last slide. <laughs> um, I'm very proud of the process, the progress we've made to date. Um, we took ideas and turned them into inventions. We tested those inventions in the preclinical setting, and now we've tested them in the human setting for the first time. But here we are at the beginning of a new marathon where we need to test our products now, continue to test them in human, and prove that not only do these products work biologically, but also clinically 
and economically. Because last I heard, we live in a pretty, how shall we say, complicated healthcare system <laughs> in which the end users who are the patients are different than the decision makers who are the surgeons, who are different than the payers who are governments and private insurers. And so, and the COVID crisis has really brought home front and center how difficult biomanufacturing and distribution of biological products are. I'm optimistic that these problems are solvable and that in another 10 years, I'll be able to come back and tell you that we've solved them. In conclusion, I'd like to invite everyone to scan their bodies and imagine all of those spare parts that we are bound to have accumulated as we go through this lifetime are made not out of metal, not out of plastic, not out of parts of our bodies carved from ourselves or other people, but out of us. We have every intention, I am here to tell you, as a field and as a company and as a scientist, I am here to tell you we have every intention of making that happen, and I hope to come back in 10 years and tell you we have. Thank you. Grazie.